I woke up today, went downstairs, um, said hi to my parents, and was reminded that this is an important anniversary for me. Uh, it is my sixth year soberversary. Um, and, you know, all the days kind of just run together during the pandemic quarantine, and I don't ever fucking know what day it is. I know what month it is, and I think that's doing pretty damn good myself. Um, so I just didn't quite register that it was the 14th, but... So it is. The actual day of my sobriety is always kind of a tricky beast to figure out because I was going through withdrawals, um, and I don't quite remember the last drink I had, but I know that the 14th is probably the best guess. I definitely didn't, did not intend that last drink to be my last drink, and, you know... Probably odds are not in my favor that it will be, but it certainly has been for the last six years. I didn't, knock on wood, I didn't have a relapse. I quit drinking and that was that. Was not easy. I was drinking every single day, all day, copious amounts of liquor. All straight from the bottle, lukewarm, bottom shelf, paca, paca. <laughs> um, and... I mean, truly, there there may have been, like, an odd day every now and then where I wouldn't be drinking, but it was truly every day, all day. It's the first thing I did in the morning and the last thing I did at night. And if I woke up in the middle of the night, I'd do it again. The only way to prevent yourself from getting sick most of the time is if you just keep liquor in your system. I started to get seizures if I didn't have that. <laughs> if I went too long without them, um, I'd have seizures. You get to this point where you depend on alcohol, not only psychologically and emotionally, but also physically, you know that there's like a serious problem. Um, and I would, there, you were always trying to strike this balance between hair of the dog, you know, just trying to keep it in your system enough to where you can still function, a functional alcoholic. And when you've had too much and you end up getting sick, like alcohol, alcohol poisoning, and you didn't always necessarily get it right. It's not an exact science. And when you're just drinking so much and not keeping track, uh, you kind of get in this pattern where you start snowballing, you know, like you just were like, oh, did I take one already? And you they just, the time in between shots gets less and less and it all becomes quite the blur. <laughs> I didn't know how to live without it. I didn't know how to exist without it. I didn't know how to breathe without it. I didn't know how to sleep without it. I didn't know how to have a relationship without it. I didn't know how to have sex without it. I didn't know how to do anything without it. But it also was controlling my life to a degree that was truly, truly insane. And there were more and more days where I was sick, you know, towards the, the last year or so. I'd have to be going to psychiatrist offices with a trash can in my hand and completely tremoring the whole time. I wouldn't be able to hold a pen, so I'd have to have my parents sign in for me. I'd have to keep taking breaks to go dry heave in the toilet. <laughs> I mean, this, and, and how much are you really going to get out of, like, a session if you can barely, like, sit there without throwing up? Um, I've been to a lot of doctor's appointments like that, trust me. I don't even take holding a pin for granted anymore because I have been sick so many fucking times. <laughs> Unfortunately, and as much as it pains me to say, there is no real way to expedite the process of recovery. It's a journey that you and only you must take. I understand that you can surround yourself with people who are in the same situation. You can go to AA, which was never something that was going to work for me. Uh, you can go to therapy. You can have, um, you can change your entire world, you know, change your environment, change your friends, change your place of residence, get rid of all those things that may be triggers or, you know, if you go to rehab or whatever and come back into the, you common to like settle into the same routine, you know, and that can just cause you to slip back into your old habits. Um, but you can do all of that, but you still have to put the work in, you know, it still has to be a conscious choice every single day, every single day, forever to not drink. That old adage, you know, uh, one day at a time, well, that is so fucking true. It's unreal. And so far for six years, I have been able to suppress those demons and make it through each 24-hour cycle without so much as looking at any liquor. I'm very fortunate. My, none of my, my family doesn't drink. Um, my mom has wine and, like, one beer a year, but they're not slinging back shots of any, like, hard alcohol, so 
I have had no temptations in that area. And even though I drive past liquor stores virtually every time I leave the house, this is Texas, they're everywhere, uh, I don't really face that, that urge. I don't get that pull to go to them. I know that I could do it in secret. I know I could just, like, go brown bag it in the parking lot and <laughs> and come home and nobody would even be the wiser. But I don't want to do that. There are certainly times where I do experience triggers and that's scary. It's like, of course I wish that I was more normal and not an addict so that I could participate in the culture, you know, or even like during the coronavirus pandemic, if I could just numb myself and soften the harsh realities or tune out the news, if I could just feel some relaxation from it, but I don't get that respite. I have to <laughs> utilize other tools in my arsenal, which you know, I'm dwindling on coping mechanisms, <laughs> healthy ones. It's it's tough, but I know I'm an addict, and that's not a possibility. Um, but that would that would be my cure for depression. I know that it can make it worse, but temporarily it does not. And I wasn't a mean drunk. Not 95% of the time, I was just laughing a lot at very stupid things on YouTube. <laughs> and sometimes going down rabbit holes of like, what does a dead body look like after eight weeks in the woods? Like, you know, sometimes I do I find that, that I'm mostly triggered by st very silly stuff, mainly in entertainment. Uh, the clinking of ice in a glass tumbler. Despite the fact that I was never someone who drank on the rocks, you know? Like, I, I truly was only a shots drinker. Beer, wine, ugh, God, gag me. But, and it's not like lukewarm cheap vodka is good. <laughs> I mean, I, we would chase that shit down so fast with whatever we could find, but it was fast. That was the whole point. And I was an anorexic for a lot of the time when I was an alcoholic, and it was a low-calorie, like, effective way to get bullets out of your fucking mind without making you gain weight. I mean, truly, there's nothing worse than being a drunk anorexic. You're bu and you know what? <laughs> I My vision impairment is because of the combination of those two things. Uh, nutritional and toxic uh, optic neuropathy. So, like you're right about it. Cravings and triggers are kind of two different things. Um, and, once again, so far I have been able to, to escape succumbing to those desires. Or those, like, psychological triggers or emotional cravings or physical cravings or whatever. Um, and that's good. I have to be proud of myself for it a little bit, even though it's one of those situations where I'm like, why am I proud of myself for digging out of a hole that I dug myself? I mean, it's it's a little difficult for me to comprehend why this is such a big deal, but on the other hand, it is. I mean, if I had continued drinking the way that I was, I would be dead probably in the next 10 years or so, or suffering from serious liver failure at some point in the future. It had already started. I had, I wasn't like cirrhotic or anything, but I I developed fatty liver disease by 2014, and that was even visible six months after I quit drinking. So July 14, 2014. That's the date we went with. And there's a reason why. Like I said in the first video, I was going through withdrawals, so it's, I don't quite know exactly, but yes, we're going with that. July 16th was the day of the Lady Gaga art pop tour stop in Houston. Something I had had tickets for since Christmas the year prior. My dad got it for me. For me and my ex, for my then girlfriend. And so I had had many, many months to plan for this, to prepare for this, to be sober for this, or at least mobile, <laughs> you know? My parents were going to drive us there, but I at least had to be able to stand up and not get arrested for like public drunkenness or whatever. Um, but no, I was going through withdrawals on that day. I couldn't even manage to be clean and dry and healthy for one day. And y'all know how big of a Lady Gaga fan I am. So the prospect of my not being able to attend the art rave was completely fucked up. And I w as I said, I was kind of at the end of the withdrawal period, but I still was shaking, cr like, mightily. I still was kind of dry heaving and salivating a lot. Um, I still felt like I could throw up at any minute. I still 
was unsteady on my feet. I was still sweating, alternating between chills and sweats. But I had to try. So I, I remember putting on my makeup. Like, everything, you just have to move so slow when you're in that state, you know? Like, every movement feels like you're doing one of those, like, astronaut training exercises, you know? <laughs> um, just spinning constantly. And... I, my hand was just shaking as I was trying to do eyeliner, and I'm just, like, stabbing my eyeball and stuff, and it was just a real... But I was hell-bent on going. This was my then-girlfriend's Christmas gift, too, you know? And she was a big Lady Gaga fan as well, so... Not to mention, my parents spent a lot of money to get us those tickets, so I had to give it a shot. And it's, like, a 45-minute drive to uh, the Toyota Center... Or to the place where she was playing from where our apartment was, and on the drive over, I just, you know, held my bucket and had my head down in between my knees and just was ready for everything to <laughs> unravel at the seams. <laughs> um, but I managed to hold it all down and make it to the show and make it through the show. And it was one of the best nights of my life, despite the fact that, like, I had to sit down through a lot of it because of how sick I felt. You know, I, I wasn't doing well, but it was still the right decision to go. However, it was the final nail in the coffin for my that alcoholic period of my life because it's difficult for me to completely place myself back into that mindset. Um, but I, I feel as though I was starting to kind of think about the idea of sobriety. I think I had been for like a year. <laughs> you know, when I got my diagnosis about my eyes and how I was permanently going to have vision disability bilaterally, um, it certainly was a wake-up call, and it came upon so suddenly, too. It's just like I went to bed one night, and it, everything seemed fine, and I woke up in the morning, and there was just this dusty film over my eyes. Um, anywhere I'd focus was blurry, and it's gotten a little better over time, but the only way to prevent it from leading to blindness was to completely stop drinking, and I wasn't inspired enough <laughs> to do it then, because wanting to do something is not the same as being able to. Um, sure, I wished I could have made my alcoholism go away, but that's not how it works, and it just wasn't my time yet. So, uh, July 4th of that year, so 10 days before I quit, um, I was in Washington, D.C. with my family for 4th of July festivities up there. Um, that kind of stuff is a really big deal to both my parents, and I never really was... I'm not one to turn down a trip to D.C. I think it's one of my favorite places in America. Um, kind of a history nerd, so I, I really dig it. I love the Smithsonian system, too. It's just incredible, even if it's hot as hell there during July. <laughs> um, it's no different than it is here, so kind of felt like home away from home. But anyway, when I was uh, there, I wasn't drinking because that's just not part of how my family travels or how my family lives their life. And... So that was several days in a row where I wasn't uh, participating in anything re relating to alcohol. But then when I came home, I went on a bender and drank myself sick. And that's just how it went on vacations, <laughs> you know. Um, when I was with my family, I wouldn't drink, and then I'd come home and I would drink in excess to the point of being very violently ill for days and days. Um, <laughs> I swear to God, one of the reasons, one of the things that helps keep me sober is that my last uh, memory of alcoholism was going through such a disgusting withdrawal. They are awful. Like, whenever people are like, oh my god, I'm so, so hungover, I'm like, you guys don't even fucking know. <laughs> you don't even know. <laughs> you were sick, you threw up, like, once. Like, these are days and days and days of, like, hallucinations and violent tremoring. You have these muscle cramps where your hand turns into, like, what I we used to call my lobster claw, but it was painful. And, like... No matter how strong my girlfriend was, she couldn't pry, you know, the fingers apart. It was insane. You are completely useless. Anything you drink immediately comes up. You fill buckets and buckets and buckets, gallons and gallons of vodka. But it, it was proof that I could go several days in a row without drinking. And I guess having that fresh in my mind on July 14th, that combined with the Lady Gaga thing, um, was enough for me to just give it a try. You know, you don't set out thinking that it's going to be forever necessarily, but yeah, it's like same goal goes back to the one day at a time thing. And that's what it was. And I, I was marking days off on the calendar. Um, I wish I would have kept that calendar by the way. I mean, it's kind of would be a nice memento, 
alas. Um, but Lady Gaga played a role in both uh, my sobriety date and why I got sober, as well as being one of the main reasons I was able to stay sober. Whenever fans say, you know, like, you saved my life, she didn't, like, probably literally, I mean, I, I could have done it without Lady Gaga, but I, I don't know what to say. I mean, these are very true things. Like, it feels silly to give a celebrity that much credit, but the facts are the facts. Um, that that art pop show was the tipping point for me, and it was one of the best nights of my life. I'd never seen her in concert before. The only concert that I'd ever been to at that point were Blink-182 and a shit ton of Brandy Carlisle. <laughs> um, and this was obviously very different, a much larger spectacle with so many, like, colorful characters, so much LGBT presence that wasn't just, like, plaid, button-down, shirted lesbians, which I love them too, but it was nice to have the whole rainbow, you know, come into focus and envelop me with its warmth and awesomeness. But afterwards, I would listen to her song Dope on repeat every time I had an urge to drink. I'd go on a walk with my dog and I'd listen to it over and over and over. It's a song about addiction and if you haven't heard it, you should. Check it out. It's really helpful. So anyways, that's my annual repeating and regurgitation of what my alcoholism looked like, particularly the very end of it. Um, it was ugly and it was a complete mess. It also had some of my favorite moments of my entire life take place within that epoch. Um, I can't deny that. Highs, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Uh, there are memories that my girlfriend at the time and I shared that truly get me through some really dark times. Like They remind me that humans aren't always terrible and that relationships are not the worst, but uh, mostly drinking was terrible and it was going to kill me and I didn't want to go out that way. <laughs> that would be a painful way to go out. So I know it makes my parents proud that I was able to quit, and so I'm proud too. What can I say? And if you're struggling with substance abuse or addiction, I am always here to talk about it. Um, I don't know much I can help.